This ESPN podcast is brought to you by GEICO. 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance. Visit GEICO.com. The BS Report is a free-flowing conversation that occasionally touches on mature subjects. First of all, this is the BS Report with Bill Simmons. It might be cool, I don't know. And if it's not, I don't care. The BS Report with Bill Simmons. Bill Simmons works for ESPN. He's also named the sports guy. And he writes a comical sports column. He must be a popular dude. The BS Report. It's got a real dirty sound. Like a rusty steak knife cutting through a well-aged steak. No. 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 Here's Bill Simmons. Welcome to the BS Report special edition. We are taping this Sunday afternoon. Jay and I are actually filming the NBA show, and we, we, we snuck out for the second half of the Knicks Thunder game to do this quick little mini All Michigan podcast. Yes, indeed. Congratulations. We're the Donna, thank you very much. We're the Donna Summers of the network. We're working hard for <laughs> yeah. the money. Yeah. You had an <laughs> outfit change? Yes, indeed. You know, um, you got to have props. So we, were you sweating out that Saturday game or what? I had no issues. I felt like Syracuse was a good team defensively they had trouble scoring and Michigan was a great team offensively and sometimes we struggle to get stops yeah and when the team's playing zone against us that means that we're not turning the ball over it's free movement on the perimeter to knock down open jump shots and once we started knocking down a couple of threes in the first half I felt like that was too much firepower for Syracuse I told you this on Friday when we did the show I thought Michigan was going to win the title after that ridiculous game they won against Kansas because if you're going to win six straight to win the title you need to have that one really super goofy, weird, we never should have won that game, or the we pulled that game out of our butt game. And it seems like it happens within the first four. That was the Kansas game. Once you have that, once you get that out of the way, you're smooth sailing after that. And plus, when you have multiple guys that can contribute, it doesn't put pressure, in this case, on your player of the year, Trey Burke, who really mm-hmm. had a pedestrian game against Syracuse. But then you have Mitch McGarry, who's come on as a starter. He's been a double-double machine, mm. had a career high in assists. Then you get Stauskas knocking down threes against Florida. Then you get Tim Hardaway Jr. playing with grit and toughness in the most previous game. So I think the Wolverines are poised to cut down the nets Monday night, and I'll be there. Hey, we should talk about it. This is the greatest 36 hours of your life, basically. This We're is. doing TV. Then you're flying. On the private jet of Hall of Fame mogul Magic Johnson, who you got the invite. You got called up to the majors. Who would have thought 20 years ago that I would be going to the game to watch my Michigan Wolverines cut down the nets and riding on a private plane with Irvin Magic Johnson? Unbelievable. This is unbelievable. Now, if you, if you had told 1993 Jalen Rose's scenario, <laughs> you would have said the Fab Five would be in the stands – all celebrating, watching, hugging each other. And yet, I mean, we're taping this Sunday, so this might change. But as of now, you guys will not all be in the stands together, which I I, I don't think America really knows like the full story or the background, all this stuff. I, I'm kind of shocked that you guys aren't going to be in the stands. So what are the reasons you five aren't going to be together? Ray Jackson is probably going to get on a plane to meet Jimmy King and myself. Jimmy is there already. Jawan Howard has a game Tuesday. He plays with the Miami Heat. I anticipate that he's going to try to come to the game Monday night. The elephant in the room has been Chris Webber. While he loves us like brothers and vice versa, there has been a communication separation that has basically taken place since we all were teammates. I think the timeout had a lot to do with it. Here's what I mean. I think he wants to disassociate himself with that moment and with that school, in theory, with us to kind of rebuild his life mentally to say, my career really started my rookie year in the NBA. But that's not really how it works. It's sad. It's unfortunate. If I saw him tomorrow, we will hug like brothers. We've never had an argument. We've never had a disagreement. But he was the person eventually that ended up having the unfortunate timeout. He was the person involved with the Ed Martin situation that led to the banners being taken down. And the wins being vacated. And the wins being vacated. He was the person that chose not to participate in the Fab Five doc. Yep. Now, hopefully, he's not the only person that chooses not to participate in celebrating Michigan basketball being back on top 20 years after we played in the final game. It will mean so much to the university, so much to the current players, especially since – 
He lives in Atlanta. Well, I was going to say, the, the, the other elephant in the room is, <laughs> he lives in Atlanta. That's where the game is. It's a 15-minute drive from his house. And the network that he actually works for has a show Tuesday night. So therefore, Monday night, the world knows that he's going to be in Atlanta. So it's almost like a flagrant omission if he decides not to come. I have a couple thoughts here. One, you know, I think some of the stuff that happened with you guys, especially the Ed Martin stuff, it's old news. Nobody yes. gives a crap anymore. Um, I think, if anything, the documentary kind of reinvented that team to some degree, especially with people under 25 who didn't totally know that whole story. I think as the years pass, there's a fondness for the Fab Five, and it was one of the last iconic college teams. And I, I don't know who's advising C Web. I know he's a stubborn guy. I, I mean, I get some of it, but man, at some point you got to let this stuff go. And I, I think the perfect place for that to happen would be in the stands for the national championship game. I mean, how long would you guys are just never going to go to another Michigan game together? <laughs> and, and, and here's why I love Jimmy King and Ray Jackson so much, because when people talk about the Fab Five team, and if you're a casual fan and you don't remember all five names, Sometimes it's one of those two players. Right. And they don't have any bitterness or any regrets about their choices to go to Michigan, about how things played out, about not having long NBA story careers. Chris was the number one pick in the draft. Right. It's not like he's homeless living under a freeway. If he was, then I would understand him being somewhat bitter about the situation. You mean $300 million playing professional basketball. He's winning. Yeah. So to your point, it would deem that he would just let it go. And I I don't know if people totally know the relationship you guys have had over the years. I mean, when did you first meet him? Me and Chris first met 12 and under AAU basketball. I was playing on a team called the Super Friends. Our coach, Curtis Hervey, who's actually the coach and the athletic director at the school I started in, in Detroit right now, the Jalen Rose Leadership Academy, was telling us about a big fella that he was going to bring to come play with us that was going to be our power forward or center. And a couple of practices went by, and he didn't show up. Then finally, Chris comes walking in the gym, long feet, short shorts, a little gangly, a little goofy, but you could tell he had skill. You could tell he had game. At that point of his career, we're talking middle school, Chris Weber was able to get the basketball bill, go coast to coast and dunk. Right. It wasn't like line up your steps, one, two, like all of us yeah. trying to dunk in the warm-ups or at halftime. Like, he was a physical specimen. So – you guys eventually decide to play at Michigan together. Yep. You were roommates. Yep. And the, and the re, he wore 44 in high school. I wore 42. The reason why he wore number four in college and I wore number five is because we were the fourth and fifth members to sign our letters of intent. So that's how intimate the situation was. So you obviously best friends all through the Michigan thing. The timeout happens. You know, obviously a terrible thing, and and you know, you've been, in some ways, you probably still haven't gotten over it. But yeah, the Carolina players, they were waiting in line at the club, Bill. We walked straight past. Right. After the game, it was over. I mean, he was somber. We were hurt that we lost. We weren't celebrating losing, but the score of the game versus the game of life. How do you deal with adversity? And we wanted to deal with that adversity. Knowing that Chris had a chance to be the number one pick in the draft, and he wasn't coming back anyway. So you went to the draft? Yep, I to was represent at the draft. Chris. We were playing John Madden. We were running a little bit late for the draft. It was in <laughs> Michigan. What do you mean you're playing John Madden? We was playing John Madden. We literally was because the draft was in Ann Arbor. Yeah. So we drove up there. I was sitting at the table with Chris when his name got called. And a year later when I got drafted, he wasn't at the table with me. Why not? I guess that was a precursor to what we're talking about right now. But you're in the league all those years. Yes. So let's say you're in Indiana and you're going to play Sacramento. Do you guys have dinner before the the night before and all that stuff? Um, when you're in opposite conferences for the fans out there listening, sometimes you play against that team twice. And when you're in the same conference, you could play against that team up to four times. So early in my career, when I was in Denver and he and Juwan was playing in Washington, we would go to dinner and hang out before the games. When I got to Indiana and he was in Washington, we were in the same conference. We played each other more times. 
we started to kind of get away from that for whatever reason. And I remember a time when Jimmy King was trying out for the Indiana Pacers and it was preseason mm. and we saw that we were going to play against Sacramento. And I was just warning Jimmy the night before we were at my house to don't be surprised if we reach out to Chris and he doesn't call us back and we don't get a chance to kick it. And Jimmy was a little bit baffled by that. Because you guys were our brothers. Yes. And it was something I didn't want him to take personal Yeah, if it didn't happen. Well, we didn't kick it and break bread the night before. We did play the game the next day. It was a preseason game. He was not playing. He was sitting behind the bench. And the relationship was a little bit distant with that. But now that I look back at it and I look at some of the things that happened during the Fab Five doc and a couple of the interviews that took place in Sacramento, in particular one where he has some not disparaging things to say about Ed Martin. Mm. And when I found out about those things, since I also had a family relationship with Ed Martin, he was a father figure to inner city kids. And let me just put this in perspective for a lot of people. When you're positive in your neighborhood and you're trying to do the right thing, regardless of whatever adults were around back in the day, regardless of whatever their walks of lives were, they wanted to make sure you stayed on the straight and narrow. So if something bad about to go down around here, people in the park doing things they're not supposed to do, hey, Jalen, you get on up out of here. We we need you to come and be a beacon for the neighborhood. We need you to be the person that They we steered you away of. from anything that would get you in trouble totally, at any point. Totally. So Ed Martin represented that for young men and young women. Since the early 80s, Bill, it just so happened the first two players to make it to the NBA were myself and Chris Webber. And Chris Weber was a player that didn't attend Southwestern. So, in theory, I introduced him to Ed Martin. So you think he blames you a little bit? I don't think he blames me a little bit because he appreciated his relationship with Ed Martin. He just handled it wrong. Yeah. I remember us being about to talk to the grand jury. And we had our attorneys there. We're young kids. We want to make sure we do the right thing. They said, tell the truth. It is not an NCAA violation to have somebody in your life since eighth grade that you used to be over there cutting this grass for him to do something for you. If it was up to me, I would have 10 more Ed Martins in my <laughs> right. life. OK, so I told the grand jury the truth. Yes, there was times where I got a winter coat from Ed. Yes, there was times when he came through and gave me a pair of boots. That did happen. The reason why Chris got implicated for lying to the grand jury. He acted like he didn't know who Ed Martin was and Ed Martin never did anything for him. And for anybody who's ever been in a courtroom or anybody who's ever been subpoenaed, you know what they did? They whipped out about a thousand pictures of them together. Right. And that was a problem. That's a huge problem. So you think as the years went along between that, the Michigan alumni were upset because he, because that whole situation disgraced the school a little bit He's playing in pro games. People are yelling time out at him, all that stuff. And at some point mentally, he said, my life, I, I want my life to start when I was 21 when I became a pro. And I don't want to think about this Michigan stuff anymore. I agree. And when we see each other, because we've seen each other multiple times during the 2000s, we were hanging out literally at my place in Los Angeles and his place in Los Angeles because he has one as well, talking about the idea of us doing the Fab Five doc. Yep. He was 100% committed to doing the doc. And then when it came time to actually schedule the shoots, he got cold feet. And I was disappointed because it was the best opportunity for him to say whatever's on his head, mm. whatever's in his heart, and let it go. Yeah, but don't you think at least part of that had to do with you were the one who was doing the doc and it wasn't his? I know, but that's more of an ego control thing. Well, this is so at least the, a little ego, though. Yes, but that's not what the Fab Five was. Right. We caught ourselves five times because you leave your ego at the door. One for all, all for one. Mm. And that's the mantra that a lot of people, I'm pretty sure, have with their siblings or their best friends. Ray Jackson, I love him just as much as I do Jawan Howard. Mm. It doesn't matter what Juwan did in the NBA or what he's doing right now. That's family. Well, there's a great clip of you guys on Best Damn Sports Show from like six years ago when uh, 
I think you were hosting and then they had Seaweb by satellite. And it was, it's just fun to watch just because I know you now and we're friends, but just seeing you guys. And it really was like watching two guys who were brothers. And it's amazing to me that it's gotten to the point that here's your school, you're in his hometown. And things have fallen to the point that he's not going to the game with you guys. I don't get it. And how about this? As a youngster that grew up in Detroit, loving Isaiah Thomas and the Bad Boys, loving Magic Johnson, who's a Michigan native, Mm. and like Penny Hardaway, I wanted to be, and Steve Smith, I wanted to be a big guard like Magic Johnson. Which, by the way, those big guards are extinct now. Six, seven or above point guards are extinct in today's game. As somebody that's a fan of the NBA and that's a friend of Magic Johnson and Isaiah Thomas, I remember the days when they would kiss each other on the cheek and go out and compete for championships. Then they had a period publicly where there was a separation. It was a long time, 20 years. Now I'm happy as somebody that if something tragically happened to him, happened to me, Magic and Isaiah and Larry Bird, my coach, would actually come and check on me. A little kid from Detroit. Yeah. So now when I see Isaiah Thomas, who I love, I'm still in contact with, who's a supporter of the Jalen Rose Leadership Academy. And when you brought that up, that's what reminded me of this. Who does Isaiah work at NBA TV with? Chris Webber. Who do I work at ABC and ESPN with? Magic Johnson. So to me, it's almost like a different version of them going in opposite directions that that period that they had. And we're so blessed that him and Isaiah Magic are on the same page now. Hopefully, Chris can not only do that with me, but it's bigger than just me. There's a Ray Jackson. There's a Jimmy King. There's a Juwan Howard as well. We should mention, I don't think everybody knows, but Magic and Isaiah, they had had a breach for about 20 years after Magic got an HIV. Some rumors had happened and then... They stopped speaking completely, and then in the last year or so, they actually made up. And Magic said it was when they started talking again, it was like, you know, nothing ever happened because you just fall into the same things you have. And I'm sure, like, if you ran into Chris, whatever, it's not like you guys would be, like, not talking to each other. Not at all. But we've never had an argument. Yeah. We've never had a disagreement. We've never had a beef about anything. We're real friends. So if there's something that the other one... Wants to call the other one on. We were able to do that with no hard feelings, no ego. Well, it's like, especially when you've been friends with somebody for that long. Like you can not talk to him forever, but <laughs> if he said, I'm in trouble, can you come down to Atlanta tomorrow? You'd be on the first flight. 100%. So much so, just like I just text Ray Jackson, yeah. just like I just text Jawan Howard, I also text Chris Weber to see, hey, you haven't done any interviews all week. Michigan's playing in the Final Four. Mm. They're playing in the championship game Monday night. What are you doing? What are you doing? We need to be there for so many different reasons. Yeah. How about just be there for Trey Burke, Tim Hardaway Jr., Glenn Robinson III, players that idolized us. Tim Hardaway Jr. has been walking around campus with a free Fab Five shirt on for three years. Is that true? That's true. I text with Trey Burke and call him on the phone. Well, you're Same like the, you're like the uncle to all those guys. Qu- correct. And they need our support. They need our love. Give them their opportunity to shine. And a lot of people ask me the question about our legacy as it relates to this 2013 championship. And let me squash this right now for everybody. The 1989 team, I idolized them. Glenn Rice, Sean Higgins, Lloyd Vaught, Terry Mills. They held up the championship trophy. We didn't. Our legacy is different from theirs. We still have a best-selling documentary. We have a best-selling book, even though Mitch yeah. album got the millions of he dollars. zero profits. That team did not. They were the champions. They have their space. We have our space. Now the 2013 team. Trey Burke has had, and I got to look back at Cassie Russell's numbers, but I want to make sure I say this accurate. Single season, this has been the best basketball year for any Michigan hoopster wow. ever. Wow. He won the AP Player of the Year. He won the Wooden Player of the Year. He won the Big Ten Player of the Year, and he has a chance to win the national championship. 
That's like my little brother. I would not miss that game for the world. Well, you, we've talked about this never on the podcast, but the bitterness that you have against Michigan as a university and how they didn't stand by you guys in a bunch of different ways. And they, I mean, 20 year anniversary of the Fab Five, they didn't invite you back for a home game. Basically. That's true, right? Well, this, Did they ever say to you guys, we want to have a Fab Five game on February 18th, Indiana's coming to down, we want to honor you guys at halftime? That never happened. Well, here's the asterisk, Bill, that they were able to hide behind, that they're not going to be able to hide behind on May 8th. On May 8th, all five of us can physically be on campus at the University of Michigan. So what does Chris Weber's 10-year separation mean for everybody that's watching? It only means if he goes to a game that he has to buy a ticket that the university can't leave him a ticket. How much money did you say he made in the NBA? It was like $280 million or something. He could buy a ticket. So you're saying I, <laughs> so they could have had a day for you. They could have had a day for you last February, and all he would have had to do was buy the worst ticket in the building, and he could have been in the building. Correct. It seems like that could have been doable. It's very doable. They should have figured that out. Why wouldn't they have celebrated the most famous team they ever had? I agree with you, and that's a separation that the university has to – either live with or move on from because they're not giving back none of those dollars and cents. Yeah, that you guys you guys made them <laughs> how much money you made them over the years. I I mean <laughs> so I can see why if if I was in your shoes, I would feel an incredible connection to the players in the team and the uniform and the guys who came before, but at the same time I'd be mad at the school. Is that fair? Well the school in turn hasn't buried the hatchet. Right. See I've buried the hatchet. Yeah. I actually have a scholarship endowment at the University of Michigan. Picture this now. There was a time where I was not getting information on the basketball program because there was a separation between all of us in the university. I didn't go back for 15 years. But during that period, I was getting scholarship updates. I was getting academic updates because I have two students that go there on my endowment. Right. Plus, I've sent another three or four kids there on my other scholarship. So I was always invested in a university that hasn't buried the hatchet with me. Yeah, but who's a better recruiter for for that school going forward than you and Chris and Juwan and Ray and Jimmy? I would think they would use you guys left and right, especially after that documentary. Like, think how many people watch that thing? 10 million? Here's a news flash. The documentary came out March of 2011. In 2012, Mitch McGarry, Stauskas, Glenn Robinson III all come to Michigan. Mm. Coincidence? 2013, they're going to be cutting down the nets Monday night. You're predicting that? I'm predicting. Okay. So the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. And people always say, well, the Fab Five didn't win anything. Newsflash. You win a regional to actually make it to the Final Four. Didn't you see the people at the press (laughs) conferences with hats and T-shirts on that said champions on them? It's not the national championship. But I could sleep at night knowing there are a lot of great players that never won a national championship. Do but you, I'm happy about our journey. I heard Bill Russell is bringing a big, giant torch for tomorrow. <laughs> and after after Michigan was the Tigers, he's going to hand it to Mitch McGarry. And he's going to say, <laughs> now it's your turn. You're now the best center in the league. So, so the best players in the world right now are <laughs> Mitch McGarry, then Kevin Durant, then LeBron James. Yeah, it's it's in some order. I'm not sure what the order is, but you know, you were talking about. I don't want to give away uh, company secrets for Michigan. I don't want to hurt your chances, but why wouldn't teams foul McGarry anytime he's around the basket? <laughs> I know. Don't ever let him get a layup or a dunk. How about I, that idea? I don't want my my alum and my fandom to get in the way and something that's going to cost us Monday night. But how about this? In college basketball, if Mitch McGarry is catching it at the free throw line area, and you're already in the bonus, why not foul him? Hit him. Why let him swing it out to Tim Hardaway for a three? Yeah. Or swing it over to Levert for a three? He had a career-high six assists with a double-double, and he shoots 40% from the line, Bill. He was getting layups and getting dunks. And that during the headlights on the foul line. Totally. I hope the rest of the NCAA doesn't catch up to this yeah, until, until next Tuesday. year. Yeah. When we already have a championship, hopefully. So you are sitting in the stands. Do you have tickets yet? I have tickets. Who are you sitting with? I'm working on better tickets. 
And the reason why is because I want to navigate it to whatever members of the Fab Five are there, that we're there together. So by the time people listen to this on Monday morning, there's a chance SeaWeb will have a change of heart. I hope so. I there's hope also, so too. There's also a chance since the NCAA wants to forget that we ever existed and you never see us on the one shiny moment. You oh, they, they banned you guys from that? Yeah, we never get shown. You got vacated from one shiny moment. UNLV never gets shown either. It seems like the teams that I grew up loving never get any love. But that's neither here nor there. But well, you guys, you guys didn't have enough hardworking players who stayed in after the gym. <laughs> yes, exactly. We didn't do a very good job of working hard. <laughs> yeah, you didn't. It was just all natural gifts. Yes, indeed. We were just uh, a talented bunch of guys that mm, happened to be freshmen. Thank God for your athletic abilities, <laughs> Jalen Rose. Good luck tomorrow. Thank I, you. Re- I listen. I'm going to be watching the game on TV. Nothing would make me happier than seeing the Fab Five celebrating. Um, I, I just think. It just bugs me. The whole thing bugs me. It and, really bugs me, too. And uh, I don't know. I hope at some point this works out. It will. Good luck. Thank you. Before I get the shot off. Whoa. Thank you for downloading the BS Report with Bill Simmons. Too much fun. Check out more podcasts at the iTunes Music Store or at PodCenter at ESPNRadio.com. Peace out. Geico presents Strange Saving Stories. Astronomers detected an interstellar transmission. It stated, Geico, 15 minutes could save you 15% or more. The implications were staggering. Was the cosmos telling us we could all save hundreds on car insurance with Geico? Or did their radar merely pick up a signal from the nearby Rufus and Clyde's morning show? We may never know. Geico, 15 minutes could save you 15% or more on car insurance.